kangaroo trial of Jesus and in Matthew chapter 27. And uh, Matthew, uh, no single um, synoptic or the Gospel of John contains all the pieces of this very complicated puzzle to the timeline from Jesus' arrest in the Garden of Gethsemane to his crucifixion. And so, uh, reading the commentaries of others who have done very great work in, in piecing together, and this is why God uh, commands us to, to study to show ourselves approved, because if, if you just get one verse out of God's Word, uh, it may enable you to be saved through faith in Jesus Christ, but it's not going to help you grow. We need the whole the whole book and the whole word fitly joined together and rightly divided where necessary. But uh, as far as the timeline is concerned, what the scholars have pieced together from the Synoptic Gospels and John's Gospel are that Jesus was arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, that he was taken before Annas and the Sanhedrin. I should say he's taken before the Sanhedrin at the house of Annas, the high priest. Then he was taken before the Sanhedrin at the house of Caiaphas, uh, who was Anna's father-in-law, who was kind of like the, the puppeteer pulling Annas's strings. Uh, he was not technically the high priest, but he was, uh, uh, in a sense, running the show. Then, uh, he was, Jesus was taken to a third religious trial in the temple, or on the temple mount. Then, when uh, they decided he was guilty or worthy of death, they took him before Pilate. Pilate found out that he was... Uh, a citizen or a resident of Galilee, and therefore said, well, this isn't my business, this is King Herod's business. So he sent him to King Herod. King Herod did not come to any conclusions regarding uh, Jesus deserving or, or not deserving death, so he sent him back to Pilate, and then uh, Pilate finally handed him over to be crucified. So you get the general idea here that no one wants to deal with Jesus. The Sanhedrin uh, judged him guilty of death, but instead of having the fortitude to, by God's word and according to the Old Testament, if someone blasphemed God, they were worthy of death, they ought to be taken outside and stoned. Well, the, the, uh, the Sanhedrin used this cute little excuse that, that since Rome is over us, we're not allowed to uh, condemn anyone to death, so we're going to hand it off to Pilate. Of course, Pilate tried to hand it off to Herod, and Herod said, uh, no, no, uh, no deal, sent him back, and Pilate finally had to send him off. So uh, you, you've got to, when you're confronted with Jesus Christ, you've got to make a decision. And the decision to postpone your decision is rejection of Christ, at least at that time. There may be a future moment in which you can come back to that place and ask God to forgive you for that sin as well as all the others that you've committed through the precious and shed blood of Jesus Christ. But you must either accept or reject Jesus Christ every time he's brought before you. And Pilate, by uh, telling the people I am free of the guilt of this man's blood, did nothing to, for, uh, to earn forgiveness. He was still as guilty as the rest of them. So we have in Matthew 27, it says, when the morning, uh, verse 1, when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate the governor. This is who they want to execute him. Then Judas, which had betrayed him, when he saw that he was condemned, who told him that? The law and most probably the Holy Spirit of God impressed upon him that he was a condemned man, guilty of death, or worthy of death, I should say. He repented himself, and here we come to one of the major problems that confronts you and I when we find out that we have sinned and that we are sinners. Are we repenting ourselves, or are we repenting before God? Judas repented himself. He realized he had done something wrong. He said he brought again the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. So if I can get this blood money off my hands, then I will be free of the guilt of having betrayed the innocent blood. No, that won't do it. Saying, I have sinned and that I have betrayed the innocent blood. And they said, what is that to us? See thou to that. And I would caution you that if you're, if you're, if you're confusing 
confessing your sins before a priest or a minister or a rabbi or a imam or a guru or some kind of uh, spiritual authority or leader in the world, if they are honest with you, they will say exactly what these priests said to Judas. What is that to us? I can't bear or carry or forgive one single man's sin. And at least, after a night of calling in false witnesses and bearing false witness and bringing false accusations before Jesus, at least they were honest enough to tell one condemned man that they couldn't do anything for him. So, learn from their moment of honesty and quit trying to come to a preacher or a priest or any religious authority in order to get right with God. In order to do that, you need to go to God through Jesus Christ. And he cast down the pieces of silver in the temple and departed and went and hanged himself. And that, that simple phrase carries with it a lot of deliberate action. He had to find the implements and find the place and arrange everything so that he could hang himself. He was so filled with guilt and remorse and he saw no other way out. Now learn also from Judas' example, don't do that. If the conviction of the Holy Spirit comes upon you, that's because God is trying to pull you in, not push you away. And unfortunately, Judas responded in, in fear and loathing, both of himself and of God, instead of saying, okay, I'm a sinner. What hope is there for me? He could have, as Peter did, gone to Christ and received forgiveness directly from Jesus, the man that he had betrayed. And the chief priest took the silver pieces and said, It is not lawful, lawful for to put them into the treasury because, because it is the price of blood. And they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field to bury strangers in. Wherefore that field was called the field of blood unto this day. Uh, verse 9 is a little curious. It says, That which fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremy the prophet. Uh, and they took the 30 pieces of silver, the price of him that was valued, whom they of the children of Israel did value, and gave for them the potter's field, as the Lord appointed me. Now, this are, these are the words of Jeremiah, but they're recorded in the book of Zechariah. So don't let anyone tell you that this is a contradiction in Scripture. It's, this is spoken in verse 9 by Jeremiah. This was recorded, written down for us in Zechariah, and there's no contradiction. Again, when people... Uh, whenever there's a, a perceived contradiction, if we actually read what it says, we'll answer those questions. Notice how religious and pious and clean and righteous these chief priests in Sanhedrin are. They uh, wanted to make sure they could not go into Pilate's um, judgment hall because they would be considered unclean and could not then partake of the Sabbath or the Passover uh, feast at the conclusion of the day. And here they cannot receive blood money and put it in the treasury, even though they're the ones that paid the money and, uh, and Judas repented and threw it back at them. They wanted to remain religiously pure and so that they could uh, continue to serve in the temple and, and take the, the, eat the Passover feast and continue to do uh, all these things that, that they thought were going to bring uh, pleasure to Almighty God and, and, in a sense, justify them before God. And in the meanwhile, they did just what Jesus said they would do. They were straining at gnats and swallowing a camel. We're going to remain clean. We're not going to go into that Gentile's judgment hall. We're not going to receive this blood money. We're not going to put anyone to death or condemn anyone to death. We, we are going to remain, by the letter of the law, religiously pure. But in the meantime, we're condemning an innocent man to death who just so happens to be the almighty Son of God in the flesh. That's a big one. I think God would be a little <coughs> bit more uh, eager to forgive someone who picked some grain on the Sabbath day than he would someone that put his son on a cross. So just, just watch these nitpicking religious people. And I'm not saying that we lower our standards. I'm not saying we change our convictions. But be very careful of people who are religiously pure while they put away the Son of God. You watch that bunch. They're a bunch of murdering liars, or lying murderers, whichever order you want to put it in. Uh, so they fulfilled what was spoken by Jeremiah, recorded by Zechariah. So they're this very religious and pious bunch 
uh, just condemned the Son of God, perfect, blameless, and sinless, to an undeserved death on a, on a Roman cross. Not even didn't have, even have the gumption to execute him themselves according to the, the law of God. Then we want to go back to Judas for a moment and talk about repentance. Repentance is a change of mind that results in a change of life. In uh, Matthew, I'm sorry, in Second Corinthians chapter seven. Paul talks a little bit about repentance. There's a lot about repentance in the scripture. But 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and beginning in verse 9, says, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that you sorrowed to repentance. For you were made sorry after a godly manner, that you might receive damage by us in nothing. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. But the sorrow of the world work of death. For behold, this selfsame thing that you sorrowed after a godly sort, what carefulness it wrought in you, yea, what cleansing of yourselves, yea, what indignation, yea, what fear, yea, what vehement desire, yea, what zeal, yea, what revenge, in all things you have approved yourselves to be clean in this matter. So Paul had written to them in a previous letter about uh, some sin that was going on in the church, and he his intention was not to make them sorry. His intention was to return them to Christ and to, and to the righteousness of God. And so he was glad that the letter made them sorry after a godly sorrow so that they would repent and return to God. It says, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. Uh, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. Now I believe that fear is a, is a fair tactic to use when drawing people to Christ, but that's not what seals them in Christ. That's just to, the, the fear of God is to alert me that I'm under God's wrath and condemnation and I will have a very horrible eternity if something doesn't change in me and for me and about me. And so what that does then is stir me up to say, I wonder if God could be forgiving to me. I wonder if God could be gracious to me. I wonder if God could be good and merciful to me. And so that fear drives me to, uh, to look for the goodness of God. And Paul said in another place that in Romans, it is the goodness of God that leadeth thee to repentance. You're not going to go to an angry, uh, vengeful, uh, wrathful God you're going to be scared by that God, but what you're going to do is go to the same God who then opens his, uh, his countenance upon you and shows you love and shows you peace and shows you mercy and shows you grace. So yes, it's the same God that's executing vengeance upon unrighteousness and upon unbelievers, but the fear only gets us to look for the goodness. It's actually the goodness of God that draws us into true and full repentance, to salvation that is not to be repented of. And in Acts chapter 20, and beginning in verse 20, Paul is uh, speaking to the elders of Ephesus as he leaves. He wants to give them some final instructions. Acts chapter 20 and verse 20. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly, and from house to house. So his preaching was exactly the same as his personal devotions and Bible studies. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, Repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And here's where Peter and Judas are eternally and diametrically separated from one another in their repentance. Peter repented toward God and was restored to his faith in Jesus Christ. Judas repented himself. There was no conviction, there was no presence, there was no spirit. It was just him repenting to himself. And perhaps he thought that what he did to himself, harming himself, ending his life, would be acceptable to God and, and cause him to be justified and righteous before God. But it wasn't faith in Jesus Christ. It was, it was re repentance to himself and justification of himself. And Peter repented toward God. And when Jesus uh, called him at the, uh, that beautiful morning breakfast with the fish on the Sea of Galilee and said, Peter, do you love me? Three times. And three times Peter realized that his, his three denials of Christ were being undone and forgiven as he confirmed to the Lord Jesus Christ and to himself, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Once again, it wasn't the sorrow of hearing the rooster crow that caused Peter uh, to truly repent. It was 
the loving invitation of Jesus Christ to receive forgiveness. And so, yes, it's good to be sorry for sin. Yes, it's good to have remorse for sin. Yes, regret. Yes, even perhaps some feeling of guilt if it points us to the good, the loving, and the kind Savior and His precious blood that was shed for us. It says in, in John chapter 1, As many as received Him, to them gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. And so if I know that Jesus died for the sins of all men, and then I put my faith in him, his blood becomes the payment not only for all sin, but now is the payment for my sin. And so I'm thankful for that, that universal invitation, but I'm, I'm very thankful for that personal um, um, revelation of reception of God's goodness and grace. Yes, he invites all men, but have you received him by faith and become a child of God? We have then... Perhaps the man who uh, best understands the gospel. In all, the, all of the scriptures, in all of human history, there's one man who understands the gospel of Christ taking my place on the cross and under God's wrath. That one man is Barabbas. It says in verse 15, Now at that feast the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. And they had a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will ye that, that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? Now this is just another of the many uh, mechan mechanisms which Pilate attempts to use to absolve himself of the guilt and of the responsibility of doing the right thing with Jesus Christ. First I'll hand him off to the religious people. You, you judge him according to your law. Then I'll hand him off to Herod. He's a, he's a citizen of your, uh, your state, your, your region. And then finally I'll ask the people, what do you want me to do with him? Well, Pilate, the question is, what are you going to do with Jesus Christ? And, and note here that uh, in verse 24 he says, when he could prevail nothing, but that a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See you to it. Judas repented himself. Pilate absolved and forgave himself. And each one was about as useful as the other. So it says when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, Whom will you that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. He already knew this was a just man. He had found no fault in him. Uh, he knew that he was not worthy of death, but he feared the crowd. When he sat down in the judgment seat, his, seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with this just man? So he knows Jesus is just. The Sanhedrin knows Jesus is just. And Pilate's wife in a dream knows that Jesus is just, undeserving of death. But the priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor, by the way, if, if Jesus said, If you hate your brother in your heart, you have murdered your brother. So even though no priest held a hammer or a nail in his hand, he murdered Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will you that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. And Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. The governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out the more, Let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water washed his hands, then he answered Then answered the people and said, His blood be on us and our children, and he released Barabbas unto them. Then he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. Well, he just added insult to injury. The man's already condemned and on his way to a cruel Roman cross to hang, as far as Pilate goes, for days, suffocating to death. And he says, hey, before he gets here, let's whip him too, just, just for the heck of it. But if you're Barabbas, and you're a prisoner, very near Pilate's Praetorium, probably in an underground cell that has a, a window that's just level with the ground so that you can hear what's going on out in Pilate's uh, judgment hall there in, in this massive crowd, you heard probably very clearly only two things. Your name. Because uh, it says in verse 21, the governor answered and said unto them, whether of the twain we release that I... Uh, that I release unto you, they said, the crowd, the mob, the loud, angry mob said, Barabbas! Barabbas! 
And then in verse 22, Pilate says to them, What shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? And they all say to him, Let him be crucified! So Barabbas, in his cell, was awaiting judgment, awaiting sentence, and he heard an angry mob yelling, Barabbas, let him be crucified! Barabbas, let him be crucified! And he probably, Pilate's voice of if not clear, came through like the uh, the parents in the peanut sound. You know, womp, 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 womp. Barabbas! Womp, 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 womp. Let him be crucified! And so can you imagine the beat of his heart, the sweating of his hands and his face? Uh, can you imagine the short, um, shallow breaths that he takes as he hears Roman centurions marching their way down the corridor and opening his cell, what he must think is about to happen. They just called out my name and for me to be crucified, and here come the guards to take me to my death. And the guard unlocks the gate to his cell, says, you're one lucky man. Although you don't deserve it, and we all know you're guilty, someone has taken your place on that cross. What's his name? Jesus. <clears throat> and do you know that the name Barabbas in Hebrew means son of the father? If Jesus took your place on your cross and you acknowledged it by faith, you would be called, according to John chapter 1, a son of the father. There is one man in human history that perfectly understands the vicarious atonement of Jesus Christ because Jesus literally and spiritually took his place on a Roman cross. The thief, even though he exercised faith and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom, that thief also died alongside Jesus. But Barabbas was spared. His life was saved as another man undeserving of that cross took his place on it. May we ever, or I should say, may we never take for granted that Jesus died for all sins and by faith in him allow his payment to be for our sin, my sin, your sin. I invite the musicians for it to close us in worship. And if anyone would like to do uh, business with the Lord, come down front or uh, any deacons that would like to come forward and receive those who need prayer.